But basically, I, I came across <clears throat> this reading. It was talking about um, ethical dilemmas that some coaches may face. Now, this is not, you know, universal. Um, a lot of it depends on what level of, of athlete you're dealing with, what sport, because we, we know that certain sports have unwritten rules and expectations. Um, we also know that certain individuals are going to have certain uh, personal responsibilities that, they, that they're going to imbue onto their profession. And we also know that organizations tend to set a culture of what is expected of those managers or those coaches as they matriculate into the organization and start influencing people. Uh, but, Backers and Parish, here are some of the basic, um, kind of a basic list of some things that could be um, of a dilemma or in that kind of nature for coaches to think about. One is the appropriateness of styles. You know, well, what do we mean by that? Um, you know, it's not, not every student athlete or youth athlete or even professional athlete responds to an authoritarian, in-your-face, um, confrontational style. Okay, some people do and some people don't. All the recent research, if you're talking about millennial generations, the I generation, as they're called as well, um, these individuals, and we're not impugning, we're just simply comparing them and contrasting them with previous generations, as, as so sort of you know, labeled in a pejorative sense, but um, they tend to be much more, um, they, they need much more emotional reassurance. So, you can make an argument that the quote-unquote tough love that some sort of aggressive coaches show might be needed for this generation because they don't receive that kind of confrontational style anywhere else and it helps to prepare them for you know, quote unquote life. Or you could say that this group isn't necessarily going to respond well and whatever lessons you're trying to teach using that very, very aggressive style are not necessarily going to resonate with them. Also, one of the things that we do know is um, the type of style that you use, the type of leader that you are, is really going to influence retention of material, future, future success, but then also for youth athletes or scholastic athletes as well. There's the idea of um, burnout. You know, a lot of individuals that if, if as these kids are coming through, um, if the coach is constantly berating them, then the chance for burning out and being tired of it, in combination with parental pressure and peer pressure and over scheduling of of their personal schedules outside of school and that kind of thing. These, these are some of the major factors that lead to burnout. So it's just something to think about. Also, when you talk about appropriateness of styles, we're not necessarily just talking about how you treat your athletes. We're talking about how you treat your other coaches. And we talk about how you um, treat the athletic administrators. Let's say, for example, if you're in an athletic department, scholastic or intercollegiate, you know, there's a professional collegiality that must exist amongst these individuals that are working within this larger division, department, or unit. Um, and so how you act and interact and, you know, some people are very abrasive. Some people are very egotistical or egocentric. Um, and if that's the case, then that's obviously something that tends to alienate people. And, and uh, it's sort of seen as selfish and involved in the process of self-grandizement and all that kind of thing. Um, the scheduling and use of facilities. And this is, you know, and this is something that kind of varies based upon the situation, the school, the rec center, the environment. But um, there, was a, there was an example here at WSU where you had that indoor practice softball baseball complex that was built. And um, you had one athletic program that said, well, we're going to use the facility from this time to this time. And another athletic program said, well, hey, that's not fair. You're dominating. Um, you all are dominating the facility. We need to have um, fair and equitable access to it so we can utilize that as well. And then in re sort of in rebuttal, the previous athletic program said, hey, look, it was our reputation and our money. The donors liked this particular program over the other one. Um, and that's what built it, therefore it's ours and we're going to use it. Well, the problem, well, I mean, as, as ridiculous as that sounds and sort of petty, it sounds like, you know, two-year-olds, or not two-year-olds, but, you know, five-year-olds that get into a fight and say, well, it's my toy and I'm going to leave, and they just kind of stomp off and throw a fit. Okay, 
if you say, hey, look, this is our facility, the problem is that indoor facility is actually run by this division on campus. It's not run by an athletic department staff. It's run by campus recreation. And it's built with money. And when money is built with state and private donors, you have to have kind of um, a division of labor, shared responsibility, and how that facility is going to be used. Therefore, it was built for baseball and softball. So the people in those offices, the coaches, the managers, have to understand what it means to share, cooperate, and um, work with other. A sense of professional courtesy and cooperation must exist. That's kind of what that example is about. Um, all programs are important, whether you believe them or not. If they're in the athletic department, they're all important. As a result, everyone needs to share the sandbox. Academic ineligibility. <clears throat> we talked about this before. Uh, some coaches say, look, you need to take care of your business and stay eligible. Well, the point of going to college, well, this, is, this gets into such a philosophical debate, but what's the point of going to college? Is it to remain eligible? Or is it, and some people say, well, it's to get that piece of paper. And that's true to some extent. And once you get that diploma, that piece of paper it shows everyone, hey, look, I can be trained and blah, blah, blah. Um, originally, the whole idea of higher education was to better yourself to be a more well-rounded and holistic person, to learn different ideas, expand your mind and therefore your experiences, which is going to influence your worldview. And then as you matriculate into the business organizational environment, you have a larger, broader worldview, so therefore you can make decisions and set up policy and protocol in a much more effective manner. If you're taking a bunch of what, you know, what they used to call PUD classes so that you can stay eligible and the coach is enabling that, then the coach is going against the NCAA, the NAIA, the NJCAA uh, mission that sport is supposed to contribute to the educational experience. And so you have some kind of messed up priorities there. Again, there, being that these are ethical dilemmas, which means there's no right or wrong answer, you can make the argument from either viewpoint that um, your point of view, your opinion is correct. Running at the score um, obviously, this tends to be something much more uh, of a kind of youth sport or scholastic sport issue. We do come across it in college athletics. Um, in the professional ranks, it, it's kind of back and forth. Some coaches say, hey, look, your job as a professional is to stop us from scoring. My job's not to, you know. So it's a little bit different when you get to the professional or the elite level. Um, but when you're talking about and, and I know that college sports oftentimes sometimes is considered elite, um, so there is some gray area there. But you still have these issues about how far do you go? You know, if you're trying to move up in the polls, do you try to score that extra touchdown so that the human aspect of the polls will see you as better and move you up from three to two, or you know that kind of thing? Another thing, <clears throat> and this is as being housed in the sport management department, this is something that's kind of interesting, is juggling jobs, family, life, that kind of thing. And this has become um, a topic of discussion, honestly, for sport managers and for coaches as well. And I'll, t I'll give you the sport management point of view. You have a lot of individuals that, um, you know, many of you are GAs. Um, and if you don't know, then some of our GAs, you know, they work in athletics or campus recreation. Some of them will work upwards of 60, 70 hours a week. Okay, they don't get paid for that necessarily, and it's going to cut into their personal life. It's going to greatly impact their academic life. Um, so now take that to and, and apply it to this idea of coaching. You've heard the, the the old stories of coaches that had cots or beds in their office because they never leave their office and they don't go home. But then you have some coaches that say, hey, uh. I think Bronco Mendenhall, who's a no, I think the the football coach at uh, BYU, he was um, he was really big on family, and it's kind of in conjunction with the athletic department, the mission of the university, and that kind of thing. But you know they would have it where lights out at say seven or eight o'clock, in that you can't be in the office after that because our job is important, yes, but it's not the only thing. And if you have a head coach especially that sets a culture, um, then what that does is that helps to define the environment and the climate. It's not saying that that coach is going to be successful or unsuccessful. 
with regards to uh, winning percentages or anything like that. We just don't have any research that backs that up. But you could make the argument that the quality of life, and, and that's one of those things there, um, quality of life is, is maybe slightly higher for those assistant coaches because the head coach you know, talks about developing those other aspects of your life. Um, and then you also think about student athletes. You know, if they practice more than X number of hours a week, then um, the team captain, sort of representing the team, can sign waivers for the NCAA saying, hey, the coach didn't make us do this, we wanted to do it, and it was okay. We also know that there are a lot of coaches in the NCAA that make this mandatory. They take the forms to the team captain and say, hey, we need to sign these so the coach doesn't get in trouble. You know, student athletes, they have a right to a life outside of their game, their sport. It's not their occupation. It, you know, regardless of what some people say, theoretically, until the system changes, they're there to be students as well, and time must be given for that. And this is what Rich Rodriguez, when he was um, eventually fired from Michigan, this was one of the things that really, yes, he wasn't winning games, but he sort of ran afoul of the NCAA because he was forcing people to practice. Or like the voluntary, in quotes, um, practices during the summer for football, perhaps. Um, it's usually run by like a strength and conditioning coach or something like that. And it's noted that if you don't show up, so it's kind of held against student athletes, even though it's supposed to be voluntary, but it's only listed as voluntary because that would violate NCAA rules. So this whole idea of quality of life and juggling multiple spheres and those people that are not able to set a climate to juggle these things and manage times, those are the people that tend to have a, um, a role homogeneity within their identity. They're focused on just one thing. And so if you're a coach and you've done this for 45 years, where you maybe technically you have a family or whatever, but your life has been coaching, you retire, then what? Your whole life has been football and you can't give it up, let's say. Or your whole life has been basketball and you can't give it up. That's when they talk about, you know, coaching is in your blood. Yeah, okay, I understand. But for some people, they make that choice. As a head coach, for example, though, even though you make that choice, you're also making that choice for everyone on your coaching staff and your student athletes. So there is some responsibility in making that choice. It's not just impacting you. Uh, coaching males versus coaching females. If you're a male and you're coaching a female sport or vice versa, which obviously doesn't happen very much, but, you know, we're still hoping, knock on wood, that... Uh, the climate in the NCAA and the NAI, even scholastic sports will start to change. But um, there are certain things. You know, if you have a, if you're a male coach and you have a women's locker room, you know, there are some proprieties that have to be observed. And how do you go about dealing with those issues? How do you, you know, when you talk about um, female-centric issues, um, you know, do you want to make sure that you have an, a female assistant coach on staff that can help with some of those things, provide a, some similar input, or do you want to make sure that you have you know, all male coaches. It, it just there's a lot of different things to think about in terms of not just proprieties and legalities, but also in terms of providing that social support. For example, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying all women, young women would be like this, but maybe some young women would prefer to talk about these female-centric issues with a female coach, not just a head coach. Or that happens to be male. So, you know, is there a responsibility? Is there a duty for a you know, when, when dealing with the opposite gender, yes. I'm not telling you what that is by any means. Um, but we do see it in management, and it does make sense that these ideas are going to be um, out there in uh, in coaching as well. Another thing, when you're dealing with the whole idea of males, females, and kind of under this, under this idea of um, gender becomes sexual orientation. And that's something that we've seen quite a bit recently with coaches telling players, hey, you know, especially if you're gay or lesbian, uh, you don't promote it, kind of hide it a little bit because it's going to be bad for the program. Uh, some coaches, assistant coaches, um, say, hey, look, we're, we're not necessarily a program that um, allows the lifestyle of certain players to be on our team. So if you come here, you have to be heterosexual, for example. And like I said earlier, ESPN the magazine did some wonderful investigative pieces talking about this and looking at the negative recruiting and leveraging homosexuality and the lesbian stigma against um, some very, very, very prominent um, female basketball recruits in the NCAA that were um, that uh, were openly lesbian 
and sexual orientation sort of became a, a real issue. Um, and also, you know, we talk a lot about this in terms of relationships. As you start getting into that college age and, and maybe beyond, the personal relationships of coaches and players. You know, if you have, um, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, you, you tend to you hear a lot of stories about head coaches and players being romantically and physically linked and involved and things like that. Um, that's again, that's another ethical dilemma. If they're over the age of 18 and, and you all are consenting adults and this is something you want to engage in regardless of um, the nature of the orientation, some would say, hey, back off, let them do what they want to do because you know, I, I have lots of friends that uh, married their spouse that uh, they met at their work and their job, you know, so you have managers and, you know, I, I've never, you know, I, I I don't want to tell, my job is not to tell anyone what to do here, that's the job of the, the coaches and the players to enter into that agreement, make sure everything's, you know, legally on the up and up, but then also it's it's personal choices and decisions and oftentimes the organization, if it's in the athletic department, for example, is going to have a an established culture of what is frowned upon, um, kind of those unwritten rules, those norms, if you will. And then again, knowing your role or roles, again, is it's kind of an extension of, of some of the things we've been talking about is, as a head coach, yes, if I'm an assistant coach and you're the head coach, then you can tell me my responsibilities. But you cannot force your personal viewpoints and worldview on me. You have to know your role. If I ask your opinion on, I don't know, how to manage something, how to deal with a particular issue, um, okay, then you can't take that opportunity to stand on your soapbox and give your ideologies. Example, uh, if you remember me talking about my friend that was the, that is the, the basketball coach at the Division II level for women, and um, he was dealing with some student athletes that were coming to him and they had questions because they were, they were pregnant and they had questions about that. Um, Knowing your role means some people take that as an opportunity to launch off into an um, wedlock or an abortion discussion. Some people believe that's what they can do. Others believe that is wrong. Uh, keeping in mind there are um, federal laws regarding what you can and cannot talk about in the business setting. What you know, what constitutes sexual harassment, and how far you can go in terms of giving your opinion. So, you know, as long as you stay within those bounds, then it's up to individuals to think about your roles. Sorry, we have another phone call. My apologies. All right, sorry about that. I said before, you know, you record these lectures in the office and people call. Anyway, uh, the other thing, you know, we're kind of thinking about ethical dilemmas. Um, I kind of <laughs> I would title this like profile courage. And why does this keep doing this? I apologize. It's rather irritating, I'm sure. Um, and so it's just kind of thinking about um, and kind of goes in conjunction with um, the, the online participation assignment and that kind of thing. But when you're thinking about ethical dilemmas within coaching, that's one way um, to to address whether a coach is successful or not. And so these are just questions to think about. You know, which coaches across the sporting landscape are successful and which ones fail? What are some commonalities? Now, obviously, you have to decide what constitutes success and what constitutes failure. But I'm thinking more about the social development aspect, not just the winning, um, not just wins and losses, that kind of thing. And I know, like, in law enforcement, you... Develop profiling is, is is a kind of an inaccurate word to use, but you develop a profile, which is just kind of a loose sketch about someone and some of the things that they do. And you talk about a person of interest, and a person of interest can be something good or bad. It's not always bad, but the idea is, you know, as you go through this online assignment, is to look at developing uh, a basic sketch of of a of a successful or unsuccessful coach and start trying to answer those questions why they're successful or why that person is unsuccessful. And you think about specific attributes. Well, they have a high graduation rate, for example, if we're talking about collegiate coaches. Or um, players, even after they graduate, um, 
still want to be associated with the program and have good relationships with the coaches. They have positive impact with the people that come through um, their programs. Or also think about, you know, I know a lot of coaches have summer camps, you know, um, and, and I've heard good and bad stories about head, kind of high profile head coaches. Some don't invest in those summer camps except by simply putting their name on it and taking the their chunk of revenue from it. Others spend a lot of time investing in that. You know, so think about you know what constitutes a successful coach. Think about if you're talking about at the end of a coach's career that they've done a lot of good things or they were a coach that was mired in controversy. Why? You know, one of the things that and we're not criticizing, but Coach Calipari, University of Kentucky the men's basketball coach. Um, you, you can't argue with the success that his teams have had over his entire career at the Division I level. And I'm thinking primarily of Massachusetts, Memphis, and then now Kentucky. He's always been able to recruit good players, um, but there's always been other coaches that complain about him. Many of the schools, as he leaves, they eventually are put on probation for things that happened to his program under his watch, whether he knew about them or not, he's still culpable. That's kind of what the NCAA says. Um, and so there's there's a lot of people that say, eh, he's kind of, he leaves a bad taste in some people's mouth. Is he a successful or an unsuccessful coach? Something to ponder. Um, and just kind of sticking with Kentucky, Adolph Rupp, Rupp Arena where the basketball team plays, um, was one of the most successful wins and losses coaches of all time but um, was openly pretty racist and would not for a very, very, very long time recruit any black players to the University of Kentucky or players of, of minority status or color. And it was rumored, don't know for sure, but it was rumored that he had ties to the KKK. So as a result, again, we don't know all this for sure. All we know, all the record is that Kentucky was fairly late to start recruiting players and starting um, minority players and that kind of thing. But, is that a successful coach or not? You talk, oh, Joe Paterno, uh, Penn State football. You know, for a long time, the, the, the old story is, um, and I believe it to be true, kind of listening to the sources and stuff, that he literally fired an assistant coach for teaching the players, the defense, or the offensive lineman, how to hold and break one of the rules of the game. And he said, we don't do that at Penn State. We don't teach someone how to cheat. Okay? And that, and he's given, you know, his family gave, he and his wife gave over $2 million, I believe, to the library. They had a very, he had a very good graduation rate of his players. The players seemed to love him. They loved Penn State. But then at the end of his career, mired in the Jerry Sandusky controversy and everything that happened, um, the statue of him was taken down outside of Beaver Stadium. Um, a lot of his wins were struck from the record, so he's no longer the winningest college football coach of all time. You know, you had a lot of different things. Is he a good coach? Is he a successful coach? Is he not? I don't know. I think of Pat Summit, famous coach John Wooden, uh, Bobby Bowden at Florida State in uh, college football. A lot of wins. And it was a kind of the amount of money and a shoe scandal that essentially was the um, the final straw with regards to kind of moving him out and him being asked to retire and fired and all that kind of stuff. So th the object of what it is you're going to be doing is talking about what makes a successful coach. I don't care what level you talk about, you know, youth level or whatever, but you're going to do a, a profile of a coach. You're going to identify someone and you're going to identify a couple different things, three or four different things, and you're going to use some sources. You know, try to find out a little bit about this person. And you're going to post you know, in a little blog that people are going to respond to. Here's this person. This is what they coach. This is what they do. And this is why they are successful or not successful from my point of view. And that's, that's what I'm talking about here. Is, you know, if, if we're able to start to develop a consistent set of expectations or at least a typology for understanding what constitutes success, then we can start to evaluate whether a coach is impactful or not impactful.